Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer, and I'm joined with Aaron. Hey, I'm Aaron, and I work with Dr. Rob, and I ask him a bunch of questions that he usually wants to answer. And today I've got a very special one. Dr. Rob, how do you feel about pressure necrosis? Is that something you have to deal with a lot? Wow. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, that is a loaded question. Um, because I've been I've been working on uh, a uh, it's more than just a paper uh, it's more it's a it's a theory and a paper it's a lot that has to go into it but um, I don't believe pressure necrosis exists in dental implants and uh, I've got I think I'm up to fifty three reasons why it doesn't exist and that starts to become somewhat overwhelming. When you think about it, now the thing about it, pressure necrosis is, is a kind of a catch-all that people use when they have an implant that otherwise they don't know why it failed, and they say, "Well, I had a lot of torque when I inserted the implant, so it must have been pressure necrosis." And the problem that I have, just at the at the highest level with the concept of pressure necrosis, is this: what's its definition? And so people say, "Well, what do you mean by that?" And I say, "Well." Let's say I have a case, and let's just for the sake of the argument, we say pressure necrosis exists. So I put an implant in with high torque, and it results in, 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 in the implant failing. How does that failure represent itself? What, what does it look like? And how does that differ from somebody who's on, um, who has a, a vitamin D deficiency or a smoker or a diabetic or any other systemic illness? So what what would that failure look like in terms of would the radiographs look different uh, during the failure? Would the failure happen in the first week, second week, first month, second month, second year? When, when does the failure occur? What does that failure look like? And the answer is, well, none of that's been, none of that's been vetted, right? So there, there is no definition. In fact, there is no definition of pressure necrosis. It's, it's, um, more of a colloquial term that people use. But when you say, well, what does it mean? They go, well, it means you put too much pressure on the bone. I said, but what does that mean? So when you break bone down, you break it down into the uh, uh, anorganic and the organic matter, right? The If you look at it, you say, well, bone is composed of, of minerals. Are we worried about the minerals being compressed? Are we compressing the minerals in the bone? And they go, no, it's not the minerals. Okay, so it's not the mineral content. Well, then what, a, what about the crystalline content? They go, well, now the crystals are really strong. We're not worried about crystals. So it must be the collagen, the type 1 collagen that's in the bone. That must be the problem. Well, collagen is the strongest protein in our body. Okay, so it pound for pound is stronger than a steel chain. So I'm not worried about the collagen either. Okay, so now we're down to less than 10% of, of what bone is made of. We go down to about one to two percent to the cellular content. So you have very few cells in the bone, right? The, the, the osteocytes uh, are very few and far between. And so you say, well, what about those? What if you kill those? They so say, okay, what if pressure necrosis resulted in the local death of the osteocytes, okay? Uh, they, upon death, would release growth factors that would then initiate the osteoblast, osteoclast activity. In other words, time to turn the bone over. Just like when bone ever dies, whenever we have bone that dies in the body through a fracture or a splinter or, you know, of the bone, it, it turns these mechanisms on and they immediately start to turn over. So then you could ask yourself the following question. You could say, if these cells died and they uh, they turned over and the bone died in that area, would you not have the world's best autogenous graft up against your implant? Because I'm pretty certain that most of us graft sites. And so when we graft sites, we use dead bone. So we're taking dead bone, putting it in a, in a, in a socket up against an implant, and it turns over and turns into, it turns into a healthy, healed implant. So if you have an implant that's in autogenous bone, and some of that autogenous bone dies, it is the gold standard for bone grafting, right up against the implant. And so you say, okay, that's, you know, and, and so you say, well, maybe, maybe it's not the cell death. So then it becomes very convoluted in just trying to determine 
what the definition of this term that we all hear, but we don't spend much time talking about, it becomes uh, rather uh, convoluted, you see, because you, you don't even have a definition of it in terms of, of what it is. And it gets, it keeps going on and on and on because then, then we go from there to another principle called creep. And in engineering, creep is when something changes shape under a constant load. And so uh, a great example of creep would be the old glass that we have in the old, in the old houses. The glass over time, it starts to creep and it starts to get thicker at the bottom than it was at the top. It's it, by gravity, the constant force of gravity, pulling on the old glass, the glass would then creep and get fatter at the bottom. Okay, so that's an example of creep. So it turns out that bone has a well-documented creep curve, which means that if I was to apply pressure to the bone and hold that pressure on the bone over time, the bone will move. So the pressure that we apply at the time of insertion of an implant is not the pressure that's on that bone five to 10 minutes later that bone will have relaxed. If that doesn't make sense to you and it doesn't register with you, if you've ever taken out an upper first molar using an 88R, okay? You, 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 get on the, you get on the tooth with an 88R and you pull to the buckle and you hold with constant pressure. And after 30 seconds to 60 seconds, the bone starts to move. You feel it and you see it. And this is the whole principle behind the physics forceps, the golden mish physics forceps that, that people see at the trade shows. It's the whole principle behind it. So bone moves. If that doesn't make sense, then you might say, well, I still don't understand this concept of, of bone moving because you think of bone like, like an inanimate object, like concrete, just doesn't move, right? Okay, so how about a ridge split? So we know that we can, we can take a ridge that's atrophic and we can make a small little slit right along the top of it. And then we can use some wedges and or, or threaded instruments that act like wedges to go down into that to spread that ridge. And we spread that ridge out and right before our eyes, the bone moves. It, it moves right before our eyes, you know, and it's, it's moving. So it it's, has an elastic characteristic to it. And that comes from the collagen that's in the bone. It doesn't come from the crystalline structure. That's rather brittle, right? But the collagen component of the bone is elastic, right? And so it's moving. And so you get this, you get this bone creep. So even if we had high pressures, uh, you wouldn't see likely, and that a few minutes later, you wouldn't see those same pressures. And so you say, well, we come back to this idea of insertion torque. And you say, well, we have this high torque. Well, here's, here's what I think is really happening. Uh, if we get down to it, I'm not going to deny that with high insertion torques, you may see higher failure rates. But I believe the answer is not pressure necrosis. It's called crappy bone. In other words, in order to get an insertion torque of, say, 100 newton centimeters on your torque wrench, you have to be going into D1 bone. So you're not going to go into soft D3, D4 bone, woven bone of heal, healing bone, bone that was, that's new that you grew three or four months ago. You're not going to get those kinds of insertion torques. You, you might uh, if you go deeper and you engage the, the cortical plates that are deeper, but not in the bone itself. It's a soft new bone. It won't happen. So you'll, see, you'll typically find that the lower anterior on an old person is is lost a lot of its trabecular space. So it's almost all D1 bone. You're talking like one of these really, really old guys, right? You go down there and you drill your hole and you pull your drill out. You have to clean the flutes out while you're drilling the hole because the flutes are getting packed with white bone, not pink bone, not red bone, white bone. White bone is bad. White bone, in, white bone in your drill flute means that you're engaging cortical bone with no blood supply, okay? There's no blood supply. And so you go down, you drill the hole, and you got to come out, you got to clean your flutes, you go back in, you go back in. You finally get the osteotomy done, and it's not bleeding. Then you take an implant, and you put the implant in there, and it has high insertion torques because the bone is mostly cortical, D1, very, very stiff. And so you get a failure postoperatively, I think, not because the bone was so stiff, but because the bone doesn't have good blood supply. The D1 bone doesn't have good blood supply. If you, if you, if you spend any time in surgery and you're cutting on the bone, you can scrape, you can use a bone scraper and scrape on cortical bone all day long. You get very little blood from it. And so you know that it has poor blood supply, which brings me to another idea, another concept with the pressure necrosis. Um, can pressure necrosis occur in trabecular bone? So trabecular bone is the bone that looks like a sponge. 
Okay, and it's very, very vascular. It has lots of ways for blood to flow around. So you put in an, you put in, uh, an implant into a trabecular bone, like in under the maxillary sinus, so the first molar position, okay, in a grafted site that's three or four months old. So you have all this D4 bone, super soft. Well, you can't, right? You can't, first of all, you can't even get the you can't even get the torque high. But but basically, you could never. What I'm saying here is, if the theory of pressure necrosis exists, you could never have pressure necrosis in soft bone. Okay, so that push all the soft bone failures away. So that just leaves us with hard bone fa failures, really really dense bone, which predict uh, predominantly occur in the lower anterior. So in the lower anterior, you got the D1 rock hard bone, but it's not the bone. It's the lack of blood supply. It's the lack of blood supply. Here's another thing. If pressure necrosis occurs, and it only occurs in dense bone, but dense bone doesn't have good blood supply, then it's not cutting off the blood supply that you're worried about. In other words, people might say, well, you have a blood flow in the bone, and, and what happens is you've compressed the bone so much that you cut off the blood supply, and that's why the bone dies. But D1 bone doesn't have blood supply in the first place. D1 bone gets most of its blood supply from the periosteum on the outside, and the endosteum on the inside. But going into the lower anterior, there isn't any endosteum on an old person because it's all gone away. It's all turned into cortical bone over the years. So you only have periosteum to start with. So you, you, you have a poor blood supply situation. So I believe seeing higher incidences of failures is not a pressure necrosis issue. It's a poor bone quality issue. You're going into, into bone that stinks. So how do I manage, when I go into really hard bone like this, how do I manage it? Here's how I manage it. I do something we learned in the garage. So this is lessons from the garage. It's called how you tap metal, how you tap a, an object, plastic or metal. And the way you do it is you insert your, your tap and you go in two turns and you back out one, okay? Then you go in two more and you back out one. And systematically, as you go in two, but only back out one, you're going in, but as you back up, you're clearing out space. You're clearing out chips into the flutes and you're clearing out space so you can get your tap all the way in. So when I go into a case where I have really, really dense bone, I have high insertion torques, what I do is before I get all the way down to the depth, I'm usually, let's say four, four threads away from being all the way down to the proper depth. I put my motor in reverse or my handpiece and I back it out a little bit. And then I go forward a little bit and then I back it out a little bit and then I go forward a little bit and I basically tap the bone. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a little bit of airspace, a little bit of room, a little bit of clearance between my, my implant and the bone to allow for natural turnover of the bone, but also some space for the blood to flow. I'm trying to make a little bit of room because it's too dense. And so that's what I do when I have really high bone. I reduce my insertion torque to the point where I have a little bit of space around it for better blood flow. That's that's my my um, approach to try to get around the concept of having a bad dense bone that doesn't have any blood flow. But I, I literally I'm, I'm very passionate about this because if you put some thought into it, and hopefully if you're listening to this to this little podcast here, you'll see that I'm I am pretty passionate about it, and that some of these things make a lot of a lot of sense. Absolutely. And and it's making sense to me just sitting here, and I'm not a dentist, so I hope it makes sense to you. But uh, why do you think that pressure necrosis has become such a scapegoat for a lot of implantologists? My theory on why people will say, um, I believe my implant failed because of pressure necrosis, is because dental implants' success factors are multifactorial. So is a the, the number of criteria that goes into a successful implant is dependent on many, many variables. So, you know, I've listed, I've listed up to 68 different independent variables that are related to dental implant success. And let me give you like just a couple of examples. So you would say, if, if I have two implants and everything's placed exactly the same and one was in a sterile environment and one was not in a sterile environment, the likelihood of the sterile environment maybe having a better outcome than the non-sterile would be higher. So that would be a fair assessment, right? So we say sterility is, is one of the questions. If you place a, um, a different type of implant into the, the hole, you could have a different outcome. If you do a, uh, um, a healing cap versus a transmucosal healing abutment, you may have a different outcome. If you do immediate load versus delayed load, 
versus progressive load, you may have a different outcome. The, the patient's health history may result in a different outcome. Their habits, smoking or and or chewing, may have a different outcome. So it just goes on and on and on. There's so many variables. So what happens is, is that we believe in our minds as clinicians, as people that care about other people, we believe that we've managed all of those things. And so we, we believe we've got it all managed, everything we think is, we're doing everything right, and we have a failure, and we can't accept it. Because that's not the type of people that dentists are. They're not people that accept failure, that otherwise they would have never gotten into dental school. They would have never gotten through dental school, for sure, right? Sure. So that just doesn't happen. So they're not the type of people to accept a failure. So when you have a failure, you have to have an answer. Not only, for, not only so you can sleep well at night, but also you have to give an answer to the patient. You have to give them some answer, right? The patient wants to, they want an answer. And when you tell them, well, Dr. Roberts said there's 68 reasons why implants fail and I don't know. They don't like that so much. So it's really easy to say, Mrs. Smith, remember how much, how, how much force you felt when I placed the implant? And Mrs. Smith says, yes. She says, I think your bone was so hard that we got something called pressure necrosis and the implant didn't take. And so it's a nice way to deliver the message to the patient that the implant didn't take. It's easy for a patient to get behind it and say, oh, that makes sense. I felt that heavy torque. I felt that heavy force when you're replacing the implant. And uh, then the patient's not culpable because you're not saying, Mrs. Smith, I know that you were eating, you know, peanuts the day after because your sister, you know, told me she, you were, you know, you, you, you're not blaming them for chewing on the implant right away. So they, you're not putting them in jail. And uh, so it's a nice scapegoat for everyone. And so I think that's why the concept of pressure necrosis has become so uh, common. You know, if you mention it to anyone, uh, anyone in the dental industry is so yeah, pressure. Yeah, I know about pressure necrosis, but then you follow up with the questions that we that we've been kicking around today, and you realize we don't really we don't really have a there is no definition. Um, you can find it if you Google it. It's been referenced in a couple of papers. They always pop up at the top of the Google search. Uh, if you do a PubMed search, it'll pop up at the top. But it's a supposition. It's a, it's an assumption. It's not a fact. So it's in. They put it in the. Actually, the editor probably should have caught it, and probably said, "Is it no? You, you got to have a reference for this because there's no reference for it. They're just saying it, okay? And so, and if enough people say it for enough time, for a period of time, people start to believe it. But if you ask the question, if you go beyond the, the superficial and you ask yourself the question, what is it? How does it operate? What, what is really happening? What, when the bone dies, what are you saying is happening? When you start to ask those questions, then, then the facts don't line up well at all for the concept of pressure necrosis. So always be careful of that really dense bone, uh, not because of pressure in my opinion, but because it's not good bone for dental implants. It just doesn't have good blood flow. We've got to have good blood flow for osteointegration. Sounds like it's time for uh, pressure necrosis to undergo some necrosis of its own. I think so. Yeah. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you appreciated this version of this episode, rather, of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer, out.